I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Well, even though uh, we've been working on equipment problems around here, it appears that we still have a few problems. When I uh, hit the CD for the intro for the broadcast, the uh, cassette deck came on. <laughs> Go figure. I don't know what that's all about, but I know what I'm going to be doing for a good portion of the evening is uh, trying to straighten it out. Well, as most of you know, we were gone for about uh, 14 days. And uh, in our absence, WRMI played reruns of the broadcast for the international listeners and uh, uh, the listeners all across the Americas. For the listeners in Arizona and around Valley, there was no broadcast of the hour of the time. And if you've been listening, you didn't miss anything because they were, like I said, reruns. Um, today's broadcast is live, and they will be live uh, from here on out, unless we have to go somewhere again. We went up to, uh, well, let me tell you what happened. We, uh, I got my copy of Mechanics Illustrated not too long ago, and lo and behold... It uh, had an article that claimed that they had moved all the testing from Area 51, Groom Dry Lake, up to some place in, uh, in Utah or Colorado, and uh, that everything was closed down. And it showed this guy standing by an old rusty chain that uh, was across the road in, in a, a fence that was all chained up and gated and, and a rusty lock. That was supposed to make people believe that it had been all closed up for a long time. And uh, it was a pack of lies, folks. This uh, science and technology editor of Mechanics Illustrated magazine just flat invented a story. He lied to the American people. And uh, the, the gate with the rusty chain and the lock wasn't even a gate to Area 51. May not have even been in the state of Nevada, for all I know. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, folks, I just wanted to go up there and make sure. We did this last year, and uh, that was before this magazine article came out, and, and everything was operating normally when we were there. But I hadn't been since the article came out, although I had sent an email message to the uh, author at Popular Mechanics Magazine, telling him in no uncertain terms that he was full of crap and that his article was nothing but a gigantic lie. And uh, he pretended innocence. Well, folks, I visited both entrances to Area 51. Both of them are open. The warning signs are up. The uh, jackbooted thug goons who guard the approaches and discourage and frighten and intimidate and terrorize people we're all there in force, all over the place, just like they always have been. Um, the gate uh, that uh, goes into Area 51 behind Rachel was open. It was manned. <laughs> um, it hasn't shut down. There was activity. We saw buses going in and out, large, uh, big 18-wheelers going in and out. We saw aircraft and other things flying above the test site. And uh, so I just thought that uh, America and the rest of the world should know that. Uh, remember when they had the uh, Senate hearings and the director of the Central Intelligence Agency testified that they needed to maintain their ability to recruit and manage journalists as employees and operatives and agents of the Central Intelligence Agency? Well, well, that's what happens, folks. And, uh, you know, you will remember a few years ago, I read you the executive order signed by President Ronald Reagan that allows the Central Intelligence Agency to operate within the borders of the United States of America. And so they are doing that in force. 
and you're not safe. You haven't been safe for a long time, folks. And you know, if you can't read between the lines in the newspaper and uh, and uh, between the lies on the boob tube, I don't know what to tell you. <clears throat> but anyway, that's apparently what occurred there. Now, also recently, there was a show on uh, the Discovery Channel on television. The Discovery Channel is supposed to be, you know, one of these things that you can watch and they won't lie to you. It's supposed to be something you can depend upon. Well, not anymore, folks, because they also lied to you. They did a show which uh, uh, purported to show the little alien that it was all closed up and boarded up and, and was out of business, that Area 51 was all closed up and was not operating and that they had moved all the testing somewhere else and nobody knew where it was. This was on the Discovery Channel. Well, I was just there, folks. Pat and Joe Travis are still operating. The little alien is uh, still going strong, still full of customers, a lot of people still going there. The food is still as good and great as it always was. Joe is still his wonderful, jolly self and uh, will be happy to uh, serve you whatever... Uh, kind of drink or food that you imbibe in, and, and uh, Pat is still one of the greatest cooks in the state of Nevada. And they have rooms just as always. What they showed on the Discovery Channel was another lie, another deception. Uh, as you go up on Highway 93 from Las Vegas, you pass a little town called Alamo, which is really the last sign of civilization before you get to Rachel. And uh, just past Alamo, there's a place where you turn left to go on to Highway 375 to go up over Hancock Summit down in the Tickaboo Valley, cross to a Coyote Summit and then down into the little town of Rachel. Well, just as you turn left there off Highway 93 onto 375, there's an old abandoned business of some kind that's been there for many years. I've been going up there for many, 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 many years, more than I even care to count. And that's always been there. It's always been abandoned. And... Uh, uh, nobody has ever operated. And that's what they showed on the Discovery Channel and told everybody that it was the uh, little alien. Well, it's not. It appears that the government is making some all-out effort to discourage people from vis visiting the area. And they're just flat getting people to lie to you about it and print stories that are lies and do television shows that are lies. And there's no way to be kind about it, folks. The people who did these things are liars the article in Popular Mechanics was a lie, continues to be a lie, and the show about Area 51 being all closed up and Little Alien being all closed up was also a lie. And uh, I sat down and talked very seriously with Pat and Joe Travis about suing these creeps because that could have cost them an awful lot of business. Of course, I don't know if it, if it has or if it will. People who are into doing things like I do, investigating, aren't discouraged by what the government says because... We've learned over the years that most of what the government ever says is a lie. <laughs> and folks, the Discovery Channel and Popular Mechanics Magazine, I don't care what you think, were speaking for the government when they did those stories. There's no other reason to have done it than to discourage visitors from going out to the area and discovering that UFOs don't come from Mars <laughs> or anywhere else out there for that matter. Nope, they're of human origin. And their home is right here on this earth. And uh, that's the way it's always been, and I guess that may be the way it's might always be. I don't know, and neither does anybody else, about the true nature of extraterrestrial life. I can tell you this, there is no evidence anywhere Existing, listen to me carefully, folks. There is no evidence existing anywhere, anywhere, that extraterrestrial life exists, much less has ever come here. There is all kinds of evidence, and I mean hard, factual, solid evidence, that what you know as UFOs, that aren't unidentified at all for those who know about them, are of human origin and belong to the United States government in most probably several other governments also. So, uh, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Hi, 
I had a dream the other night that well, I didn't understand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat and, speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land is free and home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hope you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun. Permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press. And you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You take it Satan's number. You trade it in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors so their children will be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores and send your sons to slaughter fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you will fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear and be a slave? O oh, sons of the Republic, arise. Take a stand. Defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Preserve our great Republic and each God-given right. And pray to God to keep the torch of freedom and bright. As I awoke, he vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. We are not free. But we have ourselves to blame. For even now as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside in a dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this still the land of the free and home grave? God bless you. God bless this woman. Thank you, my good friend, David Mann. And, uh, <laughs> yes, this is the land the home of the free and the land of the brave. But there's not too many who are free. And I can't find a whole lot that are brave, but I know they're there. We have a network. I talk to a lot of them on a daily basis. But if you walk around in the city streets, just trying to pick some out at random by talking to people, what you'll find is a bunch of cowards. And that's the truth. And what's more, you all know it. George Washington said, Government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And uh, Edmund Burke said this back in the 1700s. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And i got to tell you, a lot of good men are doing absolutely nothing all across this country. 
and the ones who dare to stand up and stick their neck out and take a risk for freedom for all of us in defense of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are not generally struck down by the enemy. They're generally struck down by their own neighbors. And that's a very sad commentary. Are you guilty of that? When they come for your neighbor that you know is a patriot who's fighting for the freedom of all of us, and they tell you a lie that he's a drug dealer or some baloney like that, or that he's got automatic weapons, <laughs> are you going to stand by? Are you? Most of you will. The second article in amendment to the Constitution says, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I'm going to read you a letter. I want you all to listen to this. And when I'm talking on this broadcast, I'm talking directly to the allies of freedom. To people who have read the understanding and, and, and understand the Constitution for the United States of America. People understand the principles and ideals upon which this country was based, who, who know what freedom really is and how it's being lost. And at the same time, as a collateral, I guess, byproduct of this broadcast, maybe, just maybe, we'll wake up some other people. Maybe they'll join us. This is a letter from Sarah Brady. Sarah Brady is the leader of Handgun Control Incorporated. This is a confidential letter. It was sent out to the membership of Handgun Control Incorporated, and the members were asked not to reveal this to anyone. Well, I also have organizations dedicated to freedom and gathering information. They are intelligence collecting organizations. And we have operatives everywhere. We have operatives in all of the different church organizations in the Masonic Lodge. We have operatives in Sarah Brady's Handgun Control Incorporated. We even have patriots of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Internal Revenue Service, and believe it or not, in the White House, ladies and gentlemen. And so we get these things. And when we get them... We let you know about these things immediately. Now, this has been sitting around here for a little while. So, it's, uh, I didn't have, I was going to, <laughs> I was going to give it to you the uh, Monday of the 13th. And then that's the day we decided we had better get on the road to go do our little Area 51 investigation. And, oh, by the way, um, we also, after, after uh, we discovered what we needed to discover at Area 51, we went on to San Francisco where I read my book on tape for audiobooks. So, my book, Behold a Pale Horse, will now be available on audio tape with audiobooks throughout the country. This is a confidential memo to all the members of Handgun Control Incorporated, written by Sarah Brady. And I'm going to read it to you. Pay attention. Dear Handgun Control Member, I have marked this letter to you confidential because I am requesting that you avoid discussing the contents publicly for the next several weeks. This is because we are about to initiate action that, if successful, will weaken the stranglehold that the gun industry and the National Rifle Association and other gun fanatics have over local and national gun laws. And I am urgently requesting you to make an extraordinary gift to help strengthen our cause. In other words, stand by me. <laughs> and they do. They do send money. Lots of money. Let me continue. Please let me quickly explain our plans, and then you will understand why both your generosity and secrecy are required. In brief, we believe there is a strong parallel between the gun industry and the tobacco companies. Remember, folks, I told you this was coming. Anytime you take freedom away from one person, you take it away from everybody. I don't care how well-meaning you are. You are stupid when you do it, and eventually it comes back to bite you right in the butt. 
and bite hard. In brief, we believe there is a strong parallel between the gun industry and the tobacco companies. As you know, citizens at the local and state level rose up in anger and demanded clean air in restaurants and offices when Congress failed to take action. Here at Handgun Control Incorporated, it is our regrettable conclusion that this current Congress is not going to take the initiative on gun safety for America. Legislation is bogged down. The NRA and other gun industry lobbying groups have multi-million dollar war chests set aside for this election year. Consequently, it will be extremely difficult to pass any significant legislation this year. And so, even though we will not let up on our efforts in Congress, our focus is going to make a dramatic shift. And we want to keep this shift as quiet as possible while we develop our plan. Now listen to this carefully, folks. In a few weeks, I will be announcing to the nation the Citizens' Campaign Against Community Gun Trafficking. Now, if you don't believe you're manipulated, just listen. Even the title of this campaign will cause shockwaves. That's her words, ladies and gentlemen, not mine. Even the name of this campaign will cause shockwaves to run through the gun industry and the NRA at local and national levels. We will be taking a page from the anti-smoking victories, where local ordinances banned smoking in public facilities and eventually forced state and national legislation to protect Americans' right to a smoke-free environment. And we'll remember the victories in the anti-drunk driving movement as well. MAD was formed by a small group of mothers whose children had been killed by drunk drivers. They gathered supporters and strength at the grassroots level around the country. And before long, these mothers started to be taken seriously everywhere, even on Capitol Hill. Now, most states have tougher penalties for drunk drivers, and the liquor industry is providing anti-drunk driving messages in their advertising. In much the same way, we're going to attack the gun industry and the gun pushers at the most basic point where money is exchanged for guns, the attack point, local gun shows. Now, if you think local gun shows is the end of it, it's not. First, it will be local gun shows, and then it will be local gun shops. And then it will be local gun owners who might want to advertise in the local paper and sell a gun. I continue. Local gun shows make it extremely easy to purchase a gun for private or criminal use. And that's because most of the guns at the shows are sold by private individuals, not by dealers, and therefore, in most states, they are not covered by laws requiring background checks or paperwork. So you can walk into a gun show, strike up a conversation with the guy hawking the M1 carbine, admire its light kick, repetitive fire, and ability to accept large magazine clips. Then you talk to that strange man parading around in his military fatigues, and later you meet him on the street, give him the necessary cash, and the firearm is yours. All legal in most states as long as that fellow is not a licensed gun dealer. Loophole, the second-hand market. Right now, federal laws focus primarily on purchases of handguns from licensed dealers, and the Brady Handgun Violence and Prevention Act has stopped many criminals from buying handguns from licensed dealers. But most states have no laws preventing one individual from selling a weapon to another as long as the seller is not a licensed gun dealer. The individual purchasing the gun does not have to show identification, does not have to submit to background checks, and the person selling the gun does not need to keep a written record of the transaction or the buyer's address and social security number. Also, quite obviously, there is no waiting period. All in all, this is the most outrageous loophole in our federal gun laws. What she's talking about here, folks, is across the board registration of all firearms ownership, no matter where you get your weapon. And of course, history has demonstrated that those kinds of records are used to confiscate guns, not from criminals, but from the hands of law-abiding citizens when governments wish to become despotic. Don't believe it? Study history. 
And she goes on to say, and gun shows are where criminals do their shopping, where the secondhand gun market really thrives. And ladies and gentlemen, the real statistics say that that is a bold-faced lie. Thieves do not go, criminals do not go to gun shows to purchase weapons. They purchase hot guns on the street from other criminals. I continue. And so this is why one of our first goals in the citizens campaign against community gun trafficking is going to be to close down the gun shows. These gun shows are most often held on public property, civic centers, school gymnasiums, fairgrounds, city and county convention centers. And these giant weapons bazaars have developed considerable notoriety because of such high profile cases. Now listen to this. Listen to this bold-faced lie here. She's already connected gun ownership with tobacco. Got that? With drunks. <laughs> and now she's going to connect gun ownership to the Oklahoma City bombing, which had absolutely nothing to do with guns. Listen to this. And these giant weapons bazaars have developed considerable notoriety because of such high-profile cases as Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh, who was reported to have bought or sold weapons at gun shows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not true. Timothy McVeigh sold information at gun shows. Not guns. A recent issue of Shotgun News, the Bible of the Gun Pushers, advertised over 500 gun shows for the last three months of 1997 alone. And this does not include many of the smaller shows and swap meets. I believe that now you can see why our citizens' campaign against community gun trafficking is going to result in tremendous controversy. And I wish that we could keep it secret, 100% secret, until we are ready to launch the campaign. But unlike the National Rifle Association and the right-wing gun-toting fanatics, we do not have a multi-million dollar war chest. We depend upon grassroots support from friends like you. And so I wanted to take the calculated risk and share this plan with you and hope that you will step forward and send a significant gift to express your belief that citizens, with or without Congress, can get things done. In a few weeks, if you're interested, I will forward to you a citizen's action kit detailing exactly what can be done in your local community. We intend to bring pressure upon mayors, city councils, school boards, churches, and all property owners to ban the use of any facility for gun shows. Already, we are working with Dade County, Florida, mounting an all-out assault on gun shows in that area. Well, you know what? She's just declared herself to be an assault woman. <laughs> Maybe we should ban assault women. Just joking, folks. I'm not as cruel or as, uh, well, you know, I started to say it, and then I thought, no, I better not say that, but I'm going to say it. Or as stupid as Sarah Brady. She wants, really, to get rid of our freedom. She wants a socialist America. She wants all Americans under complete control from birth until death. And uh, she has made no bones about that, and she has not kept that secret at all. She goes on, I will be reporting to you about that innovative and successful initiative before long, but as of now, we are not quite ready to go public with the results. But I must quickly bring this letter to a close after I warn you that this is going to be a long, hard-fought campaign. After all, it took many, many years before the tobacco industry felt the heat of local citizens demanding a smoke-free environment. So we must be patient, firm, determined, and uncompromising. Our enemies will incorrectly and misleadingly scream about freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. But in turn, we will quietly remind them that America is involved in a gun war that is claiming 35,000 lives each year, including 9,000 murdered by handguns, and again, her statistics are lies. When she talks about 35,000 lives each year, she's talking about the total deaths from guns each year, most of which, ladies and gentlemen, are not from the activities of criminals, but are from the activities of police officers and people protecting themselves from criminals. And will we? Let me, uh, let me continue. 
and will remind them that Americans must responsibly report transactions involving cars, liquor, and other products. Why should gun sales be exempt? Every day, 14 children, 19 years old and under, are killed by handguns. Much of this mayhem is made possible by the use of public property for gun shows, and that's another lie. Most of that mayhem, ladies and gentlemen, is made possible by parents who will not teach their children the proper handling and use of firearms. And that's the truth. She says, these statistics are tragic proof that a state of war exists. And as you know, in my case, the statistic becomes personal heartbreak when my husband Jim was grievously wounded by a bullet intended for President Reagan. You and I must make America a safer place to live. Let's do it. Sorry, Sarah. Freedom requires risk. And this is one of the risks that we're going to have to take in order to maintain our freedom. History has shown that every people who have ever been disarmed, whether they're armed History has shown that every people who have ever been disarmed, whether their arms were swords, or spears, or guns, or bows and arrows, every time a people has been disarmed, they have been shortly thereafter either killed in a genocidal effort to eradicate them, or enslaved. That's the truth of what happens when people are disarmed. Can't happen in America? Oh, come on now. Just think how many things you've said that about already, and it's already happening in America. Don't you think it's about time you quit saying that? Because it's not true. <clears throat> it is happening in America. It is happening in America, and it will continue to happen in America. Now, if you want, <laughs> if you want more information about all of these things, and you have a computer, go to our website. It's harvest-trust.org. You don't need www or any of that other stuff. It's just http colon forward slash forward slash harvest, spelled H-A-R-V-E-S-T, dash trust, spelled T-R-U-S-T, dot O-R-G. Harvest-trust.org. You will be amazed at what you will find on our website and you will be amazed at how quickly you can document every single word of it. You will also be amazed at all of the links to all of the other places on the World Wide Web that are important to anyone who cares about freedom in the future for yourselves and for your children. And uh, so you should be taking advantage of that. We uh, spend an awful lot of time and money making that website available to you and keeping it up to date and uh, useful. It is one of the largest sites on the Internet. And just since August the 25th, 1997, we have had over 1,112,000 visitors to our website. And every month, it is growing exponentially. Uh, the first month, there was only 5,000 visitors. This month of April, there's been over 200,000 visitors to our website, and that's twice as many as last month, and next month will be twice as many as this month, if the current trend continues. You can also meet people of like mind there, and uh, talk to them. Wow. <clears throat> Remember, folks, you cannot take a freedom from someone else without taking that same freedom from you. And it's never restricted to just one thing. Remember when they passed Social Security? I know some of you remember it. Some of you getting up there in years remember when they passed Social Security, all Americans were afraid that that number would be used to brand them. And they were told by the government of the United States, they were promised that that number would never be used for anything other than their Social Security benefits, and that the Social Security benefits would only be applied to the pension of our elderly citizens. Well, now it's being given out to just about everybody who can prove some kind of a need, and uh, you can't do anything without your Social Security number anymore. And... Uh, 
But, you know, that's just one example. I could sit here and talk for the next 24 hours and name example after example after example after example. Remember how they foisted driver's licenses onto the American people? With the promise that it would make the roads safer and that nobody would be behind the wheel who did not know how to drive? <laughs> well, folks, that was, that was a big lie. The truth is that the driver's license is a revenue-generating activity. Everybody, in their effort to learn to drive, is on the road without a license. And that's the truth, and you all know it. And almost every accident, in fact, I'll say the number, because this is one of my favorite favorite discussions with police officers. Over 99.9% of all accidents are caused by licensed drivers. And I could go on. I mean, there's many, many more things that we could talk about here. <laughs> Such as property tax. Why do you pay property tax on property that you own? How can the government tax you if you really own the property? I mean, what's their interest in that? You think you own it? Well, miss a couple of your property tax payments, and we'll see if you own it. Even if it costs you a million dollars, you could miss a couple of $200 payments, and they'll take it away from you. Is that just? Is it right? Well, folks, yes, it is, because you don't own it. They do. And you may think I'm crazy for saying that, but it's the truth. If you look in the United States Code, do a word search on property, you'll find that the ownership of all property in this country is vested in the state. And it's been that way since 1933. Why? Because the money that you use to pay for your goods and services is not money at all. It's an instrument of debt. It's a worthless piece of paper. If you don't believe that, take a $1 bill out of your pocket. And if you got a $100 bill, lay it down beside that $1 bill on your coffee table, and I defy you to tell me the difference. You can't. Used to be you could. One would be worth a dollar in silver, and the other one would be worth $100 in gold. Not today. It's only worth what they're able to convince you to give them for it. That's why it says legal tender and not money. Look up the definition of note in any law dictionary. And then you'll know why each bill has two signatures on it now. A note has to have two signatures. That's a requirement. A note is an instrument of debt. It's not money. When you use a note to pay for something, you are not paying for it lawfully. You have tendered an instrument of debt, and the person that you are supposedly purchasing, whatever it is you're purchasing from him or her, has accepted it in the interim until proper payment can be made. That's why when you pay off your car, you do not get the title to your car. You get a certificate of title. How about that? <laughs> I bet... I bet you don't like that too well, do you? Nobody likes the truth, folks. Nobody. The Illuminati, ladies and gentlemen, is a secret society that penetrated and ultimately transformed French Freemasonry on the continent into a revolutionary power and shaped the creation of a new world power in North America. The world's first exposure of the Illuminati came in 1798 by way of Scotland when John Robeson, a professor of natural philosophy at Edinburgh University, published his book called Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe. Robeson was a master mason of unquestionable character in English Freemasonry. He traveled all over Europe prior to the French Revolution and frequented many continental lodges. Being a Scotsman, he naturally wanted to receive the high degrees in the Scottish Rite. It was there that he learned of the Illuminati. He appeared sympathetic to their cause. He pretended. Robeson was entrusted with Illuminati documents. And after the French Revolution and its atrocities, he studied those documents. For the first time, he realized that Republican French Masonry 
was in total opposition to the designs and directions set forth by monarchist English masonry. He therefore felt he was not infringing on his Masonic obligation of silence by unmasking this clandestine order. And lest you think the English version of Freemasonry is any better, we'll cover that on another day, because <laughs> they're not. For the same reason George Washington warned Americans of the dangers of the Illuminati, Robeson warned the British. He exposed the Illuminati as an order housed within French Freemasonry, bent on the destruction of the Catholic Church, the dethroning of all monarchies, and the confiscation of businesses and land. Its ultimate aim was to inaugurate a new world order based upon Plato's Republic, which called for world government ruled by an initiated few and backed by a military world power. Robeson went so far as to recommend that English lodges be suspended to avoid penetration into the British government by the Illuminati. Well, it never happened, and it was penetrated, and British Freemasonry is controlled by the Illuminati, as well as American Freemasonry. Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry describes Robeson's book as a, quote, history of the introduction of Freemasonry on the continent and of its corruptions and to a violent attack on the Illuminati. But while recommending that the lodges in England should be suspended, he, Robinson, makes no charge of corruption against them. In Mackey's judgment of Robeson, he seems to concur with the professor's evaluation of French Freemasonry during the Revolution, quote, so that after all, his charges are not against Freemasonry in its original constitution, but against its corruption in a time of great political excitement, end quote. Little did he know. After two world wars in Europe, a 1946 supplement to Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry revised its opinion of the Illuminati. Quote, The order of the Illuminati was the greatest single misfortune ever to befall European Freemasonry because it became at once the pattern and the point of departure for a succession of secret underground political conspiracies which divided Masonry and brought disgrace upon its name, end quote. Right out of their own mouth. Mackey also gives a brief biography of the founder of the Illuminati, a secret society founded on May the 1st, 1776, by Adam Weishaupt, who was professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt. Now, this was not, <laughs> this was not the foundation of the Illuminati, and Adam Weishaupt did not found the Illuminati. Adam Weishaupt was a Jesuit priest. The first inspector general of the order known as the Society of Jesus, who was Ignatius Loyola, was the leader of the Illuminati in Spain, long before Adam Weishaupt ever was, was born, ladies and gentlemen. But they're talking about Weishaupt here, who they believe was the founder. He wasn't. It was Ignatius Loyola is, uh, is, is, well, it goes back further than that. If, you, if you've been listening to our Mystery Babylon series, you know all about that. But I just want to make the point that when they say Adam Weishaupt founded the Illuminati, it's not true. <clears throat> They're talking about Adam Weishaupt now. Its founder at first called it the Order of the Perfectibles, but he subsequently gave it the name by which it is now universally known. Weishaupt, though a reformer in religion and a liberal in politics, had originally been a Jesuit. To give to the order of the Illuminati a higher influence, Weishaupt connected it with the Masonic Institution, after whose system of degrees of esoteric instruction and of secret modes of recognition it was organized. The character, a point within a circle, now so much used by Freemasons to represent a lodge, was invented and first used by the Illuminati. It cannot be denied that in process of time, abuses had crept into the institution and that by the influence of unworthy men, the system became corrupted. It was corrupted long before that. And the point within a circle is an ancient symbol, ladies and gentlemen, and we've discussed it many times on the hour of the time. May 1st, the day the Illuminati was founded, has become known as May Day, the universal holiday of communist countries. 
White hops, Illuminati colors, were red to represent the human blood to be shed in all future revolutions. Every May Day, the former Soviet Union flaunted its military might under thousands of red banners. As the Red Army marched down Red Square behind awesome weapons of war created to spill man's blood into rivers of red. May 1st was such a catastrophic day in the revolutionary history of the world that it has since been interwoven into our societal conscience as May Day, May Day, when transmitted along radio waves as the international signal for distress. Adam Weishaupt used symbolism to conceal both the God and the assignment of the Illuminati. For example, the word Illuminati is simply a Latin plural noun meaning enlightened ones. By itself, it may appear quite harmless. Yet, when we research its use in mystery religions and make a thorough examination of its etymology, we discover the disturbing truth that Illuminati means those who emulate Lucifer, are followers of Lucifer. For example, the ancients called Lucifer the Enlightened One, or the Light Bearer. Venus, goddess of love, was also known as the light bearer. The planet Venus is to this day called the morning star. In antiquity, Venus was known as Lucifer. In Hebrew, Lucifer is translated morning star or the shining one. The first Masonic lodge into which Weishaupt superimposed the Illuminati was the Grand Orient Lodge in Paris, France. The Grand Orient was previously organized in 1772, four years before Weishaupt founded his Illuminati. The name Grand Orient, like the name Illuminati, has a very sinister paternity. We turn to the story of Julian the Apostate to explain, and you'll begin to see how ancient this organization really is. Before Julian became Emperor of Rome, 361 to 363 A.D., he was initiated into one of the Babylonian mysteries by the Theurgist Maximus of Ephesus. As the subterranean ceremony progressed, Maximus directed his initiate, asking, Wouldst thou see the rebel? Look! Above the head of the specter shone the morning star, the star of dawn, and the angel said, In my name deny the Galilean, thrice demanded and thrice denied. Who art thou? I am the light, I am the orient, I am the morning star. How beautiful thou art, be as I am. What sadness in thine eyes. I suffer for all living, there must be neither birth nor death. Come to me, I am the shadow, I am peace, I am liberty. Rebel, I will give thee force. Break the law, love, curse him, and be as I am. Notice that the apparition of Lucifer said, I am the Orient. So too, in the veiled language of masonry, Orient actually means Lucifer, as well as the star of dawn, the morning star, the golden dawn. All of these are just metaphors for Lucifer. This fact was crucial to Weishaupt's success. He could indoctrinate his initiates by degrees under the cloak of Grand Orient Freemasonry. In time, they would be Luciferian operatives. In 1987, giving his State of the Union message to the Congress, President William Clinton made this statement. We have watched the sun set, and we are preparing our children for the new dawn. And then he talked about how little time, a thousand days, before the advent of the new millennium. And how they had so much work that had to be accomplished before that time. You see what happens, folks. You heard it. But you didn't hear it. You heard it, but you didn't hear it. In the Bible, in key phrases, all through the New Testament, 
And on many occasions, Jesus said, For those who can hear, let them hear. For those who can see, let them see. That's what he's talking about. The common language of the people does not mean the same that it means in a court of law. The common language of the people does not mean the same that it means behind the veil of secrecy in the Freemasonic Lodge. And so they can communicate messages on the airwaves to their brothers all around the world without any fear that you will understand one word of what they're talking about. It's an esoteric, which means secret or hidden, language of symbology. Practiced by the occult. The occult does not mean evil, ladies and gentlemen. It means hidden. It means secret. It means contained. And it is contained, kept secret, hidden from you. Unfortunately. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Don't miss the hour of the time tomorrow night. And God bless each and every single one of you. Portions of this broadcast came from the character claims and practical workings of Freemasonry by Charles G. Finney, written in 1869. With some 1998 editions, forward by Ed Decker, introduction and epilogue by John Daniels. The appendix contains current testimonies of four pastors who, when they shined the light of God's holy word on Freemasonry, were viciously attacked by Masons and thrown out of their own churches. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Charles G. Finney, who wrote this in 1869, was the uh, president of Oberlin College in Ohio.